Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mayor Jay Moran in the town of Manchester. Welcome, Governor Lamont, Lieutenant Governor Beiswitz, elected officials, friends, and community members. We're here to denounce the racial slurs, acts, and hate crimes that have been happening not only in our community here, but across the state. I know that uh, when two adults chase three young, boy, uh, young boys with racial slurs and scare them and terrorize them, to me that defines a hate crime. And I think we need to say we will not tolerate that here in Manchester, nor any community. And I have to tell you, I don't know if I have the right words to say all the time, but my heart is always in the right place to make sure that everyone in our community and across our area is respected and loved. And we have a lot of work to do, and I understand that. I'm reminded of one great quote, and we're only gonna be up here for a couple minutes, that I saw a couple years ago. And it said this, because governments can't legislate tolerance or eradicate hate, that's why each one of us has to find the beauty in our differences instead of the fear. Listen instead of reacting. Reach out instead of recoiling. It's up to us, all of us, not just government officials, but citizens, everyone's, to make sure that we just don't talk, that we start making changes. I know personally I've been listening uh, to people in our community, and we'll have meetings in a near week or so, and we'll start to make changes. With that, I'd like to introduce the great Lieutenant Governor of State of Connecticut, Susan Bysowitz. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, uh, members of the Manchester community and elected officials. Since June 1st, Connecticut police have investigated at least seven racial incidents in our state, in Bloomfield, in Coventry, in South Windsor, in Stonington, in Ledyard, and also indeed here in Manchester. And no young child or teenager should have to go through what young people in Manchester went through and in some of those other towns that I mentioned as well. So the governor and I are sickened and saddened by these acts of hate and violence. And we are here to say in the strongest possible way the following. First, hate, racism, and discrimination are not welcome in our state. And we condemn those acts of intolerance. Second, we call upon every person in our beautiful state to treat every other person with respect and dignity and kindness. And third, as leaders in our state and our legislature and our municipalities, we believe it is important to be role models, especially when leaders at the highest levels of our government empower and encourage racism and intolerance, or are stunningly silent. Fourth, as leaders, it's important for us to address racism and discrimination in every part of our society. And we are committed, all of us, to doing that. Fifth, we ask every person in our state to do three very simple things. First, fill out their census if they haven't done it. Our census is a social justice issue because it shows our beautiful diversity 
in our state and in our country. It shows who we are. Second, register to vote. We've seen so many young people come forward to speak up, and our voices don't matter unless we vote. So the next thing is vote on August 11th and on November 3rd. Your voice is your vote. I can't say that more strongly. Uh, and take note who is standing up and who is silent. And I will conclude on this important point. Diversity is our state's greatest strength. It is our country's greatest strength. And in these difficult times, it is more important than ever to come together to appreciate that diversity and to treat each other with dignity, respect, and with kindness. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our Governor, Ed Lamont. Well, thank you, Susan, and uh, Jay, thanks for welcoming us to this beautiful city and each and every one of the people here in Black Lives Matter. Let me just say, we're afflicted with two evil and highly contagious viruses in our body politic. Uh, one is racism and the other is COVID. Let me just say a few words on COVID first. We have, um, two days ago, we did 20,000 tests. Yesterday, we did 10,000 tests. We've, uh, the good news is we're doing more tests than we've ever done before. And there are less people who are showing symptoms and signs of infection, and that's, um, that's important. Even more, more important is uh, yesterday, the people testing positive was at 7 tenths of 1%. Uh, two days ago, and uh, yesterday was half of 1%. And uh, that's extraordinarily good news, for which I thank each and every one of you uh, for wearing the mask and doing what you can to hold down this uh, evil spread. I will say we're the third lowest infection rate in the country. Uh, the other two are Alaska and Vermont, where it's a little easier to socially distance. So um, I... I and it just reminds you that standing up and what you're doing to contain this makes a difference. And what we're talking about today when it comes to racism in our town and in our region and in our state and in our country also requires each and every one of you to stand up and make a difference. And there's such a small margin for error in COVID and in racism. And if we let that door swing ajar. Um, it's incredible how fast that infection can spread. And as Susan said, um, you know, here is a government official. We, we, try and, we try and lead by example. We're, we're proud of the most diverse administration, um, uh, proud that we have more money going in for minority uh, investments and starting up businesses more money going for our kids in schools, in distress schools, and making sure that everybody gets that opportunity. Um, we just opened up our portal for the state police. You know, everybody talks about uh, transparency. Well, let me tell you, each and every police incident is registered on that portal, almost in real time. Every video done within three or four days. Um, what we're trying to do, and every, every incident broken down by race and gender. So people, we have nothing to hide and do what we can to um, make sure that we have trust within our community and make sure you know that we're all trying to do our best for our broader community. Uh, and, but that's not enough. Uh, our legislature is coming back in the session. I see Jeff and Jason and Saud, and uh, we're going to stand up there in terms of legislation and follow through on what we got to do when it comes to justice. But I'm also here to tell you something else, that um, you can only do so much through legislation. I'm looking at each and every one of you. You also got to change the heart. You got to change the heart. And um, that takes each and every one of you standing up as um, 
you know, Susan said when you, you, you those three kids riding their bike, getting harassed by these guys in a car and shouting and the meanness and the violence, uh, you stand up. Yeah. And I ask each and every one of you to stand up. Yeah. And, I, and when you say something, say, see something, say something. And it, when it's the littlest thing, when it's that small joke that has racial overtones, don't just let it go. Don't let somebody say, oh, you're just being politically correct. You say, no, this is so contrary to everything that makes America special. You know, we're a country that respects our diversity, respects each and every individual, respects people standing up. We're a country that admires, stands up for decency, and we're never going to keep racism down unless each and every one of you stand up like you are all over here standing up today. And, you know, Susan and I and the political leaders behind us, we try and stand up and we try and lead by example. And um, we need a president of the United States who also is willing to stand up. We need a president of the United States. My God. Sometimes I think he's willing to stand up for those Confederate statues, but he wouldn't lose any sleep if um, the Statue of Liberty was knocked off her pedestal. We need people to stand up. We need people to understand what makes this country great. We need to stand up each and every day for justice and decency and respect. Believe me, we're going to do what we can uh, as government officials to make sure you know that we hear your voice. But um, we can't get anything done unless we change the heart. We can't get anything done unless we stand up for justice, stand up for decency, and stand up for Black Lives Matter. I'm proud to be with each and every one of you today, including Black Lives Matter. Turn your back. We're with you. Governor, thank you. And now it's my pleasure to bring up two members of the Manchester Board of Directors, Yolanda Castillo and Pamela Lloyd Cranford. Thank you. It's a sad day when our children can't walk down the street and be able to play without somebody saying you are the N-word. Mm -hmm. It is sad. And so do we have today the political will to do and make the strong and determined changes? Are we going to have those strong conversations? Yes, we do we have the strength to do this? And so today, I, Yolanda Castillo, Secretary of the Board of Manchester, stand here in peace, with love, strong will, and a clear voice, protesting racism, discrimination that people of color like us experience every day. Systemic racism and white privilege is deeply entrenched in our society. La lucha continues. The injustice does exist. And yet, in this struggle, we must keep the peace and protect our community. Based on the incidents that occurred in this community, the anger is understandable, and we are all hurting, and the lack of understanding and the resistance to accept our cultural differences. So today, I challenge you to begin to acknowledge and respect our differences, educate one another, and become one community, one Manchester. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Floyd Cranford, and first I would say that I am an activist against racism, and I sit in a political chair where I aim to make a difference to eradicate racism every day. That's my being. I'm going to be very short because I'm going to share this mic with uh, someone that I think is very imperative who should be here. Um, I will say that Manchester has already started to make changes through funding equity and inclusion and equity uh, collaboratives. But also, we are turning to the voices of our youth. And I'm very proud to introduce you to a young man who makes me proud, makes his family proud, makes his Manchester community proud, should make America proud. His skin is not a crime. His skin is not a crime. This is my nephew. I love him. He was born and raised in this town. And I share the mic with him because his voice should be heard because he is the future of this town, of his community, and of America. Rashad Conway. Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Rashad Conway, and I was born and raised here in Manchester, Connecticut. I'm the youngest of five children and that, my, that my parents had. My father, my father taught me at a very young age that I had to be twice as good as a black man just to be the same. He did not only say that, but he lived it and worked two jobs simultaneously as a Connecticut state trooper and uh, assistant principal of a high school. He also went to school full time and never missed a sporting event of me or any of my siblings, which is the, the most surprising to me. My rite of passage, so to speak, was when I was a teenager and I was taught the Conway Pride philosophy. It is as follows. The P in Pride stands for pride, which you have in all things that you do. The R stands for respect you must have in yourself and others. It also stands for the responsibility you have to be the best that you can be. The I stands for the integrity, that means being honest with your strength, weaknesses, spirituality, and sexuality, etc. The D stands for discipline and having the strength to do what is right instead of wrong. It also stands for the dedication you have to make your dreams become a reality. It also stands, the D E stands for excellence, the God-given excellence that God has given me in order to be the best that I can be. I didn't understand this or and or why I had to be twice as good as, uh, as just to be the same as anyone, but um, I attended Manchester High School initially and was uh, in honors and AP classes where there wasn't a lot of blacks uh, in my case. Today's society is still unfair and my father continues to express concerns for me that doesn't allow me to wear my hood when I'm driving. When I encounter the police and or others, they don't see me. They see a black young man, and that, uh, that perception has to change to be equitable that I can be continue to pursue my dreams. I love Conway Pride, but it's not easy being black in America or Manchester for that case. I don't believe in excuses, so I won't make any, but I'm striving for excellence, just like the next person, so we have to improve what we are, educating our students, how we discipline them in school, how we communicate to blacks from a professional and police perspective. Thanks for the opportunity to provide a brief synopsis of my life. Thank you. I also want to add that I'm a current uh, student at Trinity College. Excellent. Yolanda, thank you so much. Pamela, thank you so much. Rashad, thank you, and I hope you run for office someday. Um, with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Mr. Daryl Thames, who chairs the Board of Education in Manchester, along with Tracy Patterson, a member of the Board of Education. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you all for attending. Um, Rashad said something about driving his car and not having his hood on. We had a, a, a vote of whether or not students in Manchester should wear wave caps or head coverings. I voted against it. It was not because I felt that students shouldn't have the right to wear whatever head covering they would like to wear. It's because I knew that they would be looked at as different. They would be looked at and targeted. So that's why I voted against it. And some of those students are in the room right now. We have to protect our young black men because they are not being treated as the rest of the population. Now is not the time to speak in hushed tones. Now is not the time to say that it took centuries to build this institutional racism and it'll take centuries to dismantle it. Now is not the time to be polite. We've been polite. And we've been, we've been saying the same thing since the 30s, the 40s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and up until current day. Now it's time for change. Now is the time to be steadfast, the time to be bold, the time to demand changes from those in places of power. This is that time. We have to hold our elected officials accountable, like myself, to do what is right for this community and for this greater community in the state of Connecticut, and in fact, for the entire world. This is that time. This is a cross point in the life. This is a cross point in American history right now. We have to seize this moment. See this, seize this moment and be aggressive as we make long-lasting systemic changes to racism that is inbred in this country. There's no question about it. Since the Emancipation Proclamation, then came the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment said you are free and you are not a slave unless you are arrested and then you are a criminal. Once you become a criminal, you can be put back into slavery. 
So people, slaves, ex-slaves were arrested for being, for loitering, which means what? It means standing still. They were also arrested for vagrancy, which means what? Moving around. So that means they were arrested just for their very existence. Just for their very existence. And in many ways, some of this, say the same philosophy still exists. We should not be arrested. We should not be segregated, desegregated. We're not to be segregated against. We should not be counted out of jobs, homes, uh, student loans for those who have been convicted of felonies, the right to vote for those who have been convicted of felonies. There are a host of laws and legislations that empower some of the racism that, uh, that, ex that exists. And it's got to change, and we've got to be aware of it. And the time is now. This is that moment. I am here with my colleague and fellow board member, Tracy Patterson. Tracy, please. And I'd like to say one more thing. Get your knee off of my neck. Now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Patterson, and I'm a member of the Board of Ed. I also stand here before you as a mother and a wife, but first and foremost, I'm a black woman. Experiencing our current, forgive me, I have to read because I want to make sure that I make my points. Experiencing our current environment has been tough, I'm not going to lie. But what I can tell you is that no matter how tough it gets, how angry, mad, upset, and her I am over the constant images of acts of violence and racism against my people, I will not give up. I can't give up. I am raising children who look like me and who look up to me. They are the next generation who must not grow up feeling that they are not enough and they do not matter because of their black skin. They must have every opportunity that they deserve. They will not be killed for going to get pampers like our babies were here in, like our babies here in Manchester mm -hmm. who were just being children and were chased down they will not for playing in the park like Tamir Rice or walking home like Elijah McClain and Trayvon Martin for sleeping in their home like Breonna Taylor for going for a jog like Ahmaud Arbery and they will not be choked to death lying in the street with a knee on their neck like George Floyd Forgive me. We are going to dismantle the system of racism and oppression so that racist behavior, biases, and unfair treatment of black and brown people is no longer tolerated. I am here and I will not stop and I won't give up because those who fought hard for our civil rights were beaten, sprayed, jailed, and maced. And right now, our civil rights are being violated right in front of our faces on TV and social media. The work continues, a phase two, if you will. We will not go away, we will not be silenced, and we will not be pacified by simple acts that make us feel like we've won. No, you can't just remove the statues, put BET awards on CBS, and change the names of music groups, change packaging on cereal, rice, and syrup to make up for 400 years of systematic slaver, racism, slavery, and oppression. <laughs> yes, these are the right things to do, but they should have been done a long time ago. It took the death of an unarmed black man to be murdered on the street in such an inhumane, inhumane way for things to be done. And it hurts me to my core in 2020 that we cannot all agree that we just need to be all treated with dignity, respect, and with, as equal members of society. We demand equal treatment in education, health care, employment, and to cease and desist over policing our black and brown people. You will not chase our children. You will not call us out our name. And it starts here and now in my community. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's denounce, penalize and r any racist behavior and let it be known here and now that this is not tolerated here in Manchester. Manchester, please hold me and our community. I'm holding you too accountable for not allowing this in our town. Tell the truth. I am not here to just fill a seat. I'm here to make a difference. Thank you to the community leaders that continue to do this work.
I applaud you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Yusik, a ABAC, African American, African, forgive me. <laughs> um, the ABAC organization here in Manchester, the Yusik organization for being allies and supporting black and brown people, Empower of Manchester. Thank you so much. This work needs to be done, and I appreciate your efforts. And, and let's just keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl Thames. Thank you, Tracy Patterson. It's now my pleasure to bring up a legislator, State Representative Jason Rojas, uh, State Representative Jason Doucette, and State Representative Jeff Luxenberg for a few words. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, thank you, Governor, for being here today. It's so important to us. I want to say first and foremost, as a white man, I know it is not my place. I feel it is not my place to get up here and take this mic right now. But uh, as an elected official, it is my place to listen to my constituents and when the appropriate time comes to act and act strongly. And I am confident we will do that when we get back into session uh, this summer and beyond with the assistance of Governor Lamont and my colleagues here. I also want to say that I, I have two boys, 12 and 14. Um, so the incident that took place uh, a couple of weeks ago hits home for me. However, I believe in the existence of white privilege. And what that means is that when my two boys go out the door on the streets of Manchester and ride their bikes, that the likelihood of them meeting with the same uh, fate that those young boys met with that night is so much less. And that is wrong. It is just immoral. Immoral. And it's demoralizing when it happens. Um, I I've lived here in Manchester my whole life. And we, I think everyone here would agree, that we embrace the diversity in this community. We celebrate the community uh, for its diversity. My family and I f feel the same way very strongly. But we know that the problems are so much more deep-seated than that. So we have to continue to work, continue to act. I want to shout out Power Up Manchester and Karim Prescott for everything that they've been doing. It's amazing, amazing. And we will be here to listen to you and to work with you and work for you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Rojas. I'm state representative here in Manchester. I've had the privilege of representing this community uh, for 12 years. Um, and I know it's a difficult time given what happened with those three youth and the Lemon Lynn brothers and the disgusting behavior that they engaged in. Um, but I want to give a lot of credit to the community in Manchester, too, because they've chosen to elect people that look like the people who stand behind me. Um, they really rep we represent the world in which we live in. And certainly we have our challenges here in our community, um, but we also have an opportunity and we have the strength and all the people who are out here, right? Uh, certainly we are the elected officials. We hold certain powers, but we are nothing um, without all of you con con consistently communicating with us about what it is you want to see in your community. And we can't take that for granted. It took a long time to get to here. Uh, I know Daryl Thames talked about uh, we can't afford to take 100 years to dismantle the systemic racist institutions that exist in this country um, and it's going to take a lot of political power beyond those who actually hold it um, because it's all of you who actually hold all the power and you need to hold us accountable and we need to keep moving forward and making the changes that I've seen take place over the, over the last 12 years in my time as being a member of this community. Um, I live in East Hartford, I don't live in Manchester, but I very much feel like I'm a part of this community given the relationships I've built with the people. Uh, with the, the important institutions I've had the opportunity to engage with. But it's going to take a lot of work. And we cannot engage in the tranquilizing drug of gradualism right. as we get further away from the acute pain that we all felt when we saw George Floyd murdered. Um, some people are going to want to let up. You cannot let up because that's what politicians want you to do. They want you to get comfortable, right? They want you to be satisfied with the status quo so that we can be comfortable with what we have to do in our jobs. So I, I, I implore you. Do not let the energy uh, wane. Continue to be upset. Continue to be angry. Continue to demand change. In 1967, Martin Luther King uh, published his, he wrote his last manuscript. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Chaos. Right? And when he wrote that book, he was talking about, what was he talking about? Educational inequality. Jobs in our urban areas. Police brutality. Segregation. Here we are, how many years later, still dealing with the same damn issues? Right? Now is that time, people. Now is that time for all of you. Forget about us for a minute, right? 
all of you can you continue to demand higher expectations and higher accountability for the people who ask you for your vote every November. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. When I first heard of three children being hunted, harassed, attacked in our community, I was angry, angry. Not as an elected official, I was angry as a father because I have two children of color and one white child. And when I went home, I didn't know what to say to, to my children. I did not know how to explain the different world they were living in, right here in Manchester, miles from where we live. But that pain, that anger, that frustration, that dismay is nothing, compared nothing. That difficult conversation is nothing compared to the anger, the frustration, the dismay, and the pain that people of color in Manchester, in Connecticut, in the United States have dealt with for 400 years. I went to a, I went to one of the uh, peaceful demonstrations and a young person said, white supremacy and institutional racism is a serial killer on a 400 year serial killing spree. And I thought of my own children, people in this room, going outside the day after that incident happened and wondering, living with the pain and the fear of wondering if they were going to be the next victim on that killing spree. And not just victim of violence, victim of implicit bias, victim of white supremacy, victim of the fact that people of color make 55 to 60 cents to the white dollar, victim of housing segregation that is worse in Connecticut than it is around the country, victim of the fact that if they show up in a hospital, it is statistically guaranteed across the board, there is a very strong chance they're going to get worse health care treatment and worse outcomes. And so we're here today, yes, we're here together as one Manchester to denounce the two very, very, very painful racist incidents that have occurred in the last couple weeks. Yes, we're standing united to denounce those incidents. But what's next? What are we going to do to tear down the white supremacist part of our culture? What are we going to do to tear down the racism, the inequality, and the pain that it, we've experienced in this community for far too long. That's our challenge as elected officials. We can come stand here at a press conference and talk. But what are we going to do to take action on the policies that are going to make a difference for this community? So we're all, we're all here to say in one clear voice that we are going to take actions in our special, special session of the legislature that hopefully will happen this month, and that we can't wait, because the community needs action now. Words are not enough, and we're ready to act. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jason, Jason, and Jeff. I'd now like to invite State Senator Saud Anwar to the podium. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You know, today as we come together as one body, one family, one community, um, we are here because of a few incidents. And there is a individual acts and there's a society acts, acts of our society. 
the individual acts, we actually have to have a strategy around those. And, and as with respect to the systemic policy issues, we need a strategy as well for that specifically. And for individual acts, it's very clear. We actually first unite as one people, one community, and stand up and say, no, this is not allowed. This is not who we are. This is not going to be part of our community. There's no place for such activities, actions, words, in our towns, in our state, and in our country. And that's going to be period. No, no questions about that aspect. That clearly needs to be done. But if you look at the individual acts, they are a very small part of the systemic issues that are real and that need to be addressed. Um, the way I look at it is that, that we are worried about the statues. I'm worried about the statutes. That's right. Come on, come on. Because the statutes are the ones that actually have had an impact on every single life. Every single life for the past hundreds of years. And then we have to fix that. Our state is a little behind from the entire region and arguably in many parts of the country, not all parts of the country. The good news is that we have very clear leadership. Don't take the leadership from a governor, from the lieutenant governor, for the elected officials at the local level and the state level for granted. In parts of our country, with acts of hatred, racism, you will not get people to stand united. So don't take it for granted. You need to make sure that you elect the people who represent your values and represents your present and the future and a future change that is necessary. And if you are not sure about this, look at our ex example of how we have dealt with COVID. We are, thank you, Governor, for your leadership. We are actually the top in the country with respect to our response, despite having the cards that were stacked up against us in every possible way. And we followed. And, and you know, people can, uh, and our leadership can give the recommendations. But if people don't follow uh, the masks and other aspects, we are not going to get the results. And I'm blessed to say that our community and our state is way ahead of understanding and recognition. In, or even in, in our riots and concerns that people have talked about in other parts of the country, we actually look at the rallies, look at each and every individual. We were respectful. We kept our distance. We kept our masks. And then we thankfully have been able to do well. In the same way, we unite and, and address the policy issues that we have to address, and they can be addressed very well. Because we have housing issues. I'm chairing the housing committee. And then we have to address some of the zoning problems which have resulted in a major challenge in our state where 50% of all African Americans and 50% of all Latinos live on 2% of the land of this state. And if we expect our society to change and improve, we'll have to start with zoning laws. We'll have to address how the, the zoning uh, boards in our towns, in our state, across the state, how are they functioning? What is the meaning of the character of the town? We want to maintain the quote unquote character of the town. I know what that means. And that's what we have to address to fix because, you know, if you have a character that you're maintaining, then you are characterless. And we have work to do. We will do this. We stay united. And I am um, thankful for the leadership that is here, but the leadership that is out in the community. Because without your leadership, this leadership will not be held accountable and then follow the votes of each and every individual. Because that is your responsibility and hold us accountable. Thank you again. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anwar. I'd now like to bring up uh, Don Bell, who is on the East Hartford City Council, and also Awet Zagai, who is also serving on the council in East Hartford. Gentlemen. Good. Yes. Oh, Sabrina. Okay. Come on up. Madam Majority Leader. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, I am an elected official, but I'm a black man in this country first. Yes, sir. And my dad grew up in the Jim Crow South, and uh, when the governor came in, there was a discussion over the incident in Manchester and uh, how the, the kids were chased. 
by a vehicle. And it reminded me of my dad who grew up in South Carolina once telling a story about how when he was a child in the Jim Crow South, he had to hide in bushes because Klansmen and pickup trucks would try to keep him from getting an education. So while we have made progress as a country and as a state, we have a lot more work to do. We are emancipated, but we're not yet free. I want to say that one more time. We are emancipated, but we're not yet free. We are not yet free from redlining. We are not yet free from police brutality. We are not yet free from the working all your life to get a house, but getting a worse mortgage, a worse neighborhood, just because of the color of your skin. So while I denounce, and we denounce these terrible acts, we want to make it clear that it's up to all of us, as residents of this great state and neighbors in the communities that we love, to harness the energy and courage of this movement to bring about real and lasting structural change in every facet of our society. Words are not change. Addressing the racial wealth gap is. Statements do not heal. Eliminating racial disparities in health care will. Resolutions mean nothing when you don't have a plan and you don't have the action to eliminate segregation and economic and, and educational disparities. We must be bold in our fight against racism. Now is the time. It's been too long, but now is our moment. We must show our devotion to equity in our legislative chambers, in our classrooms, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods. It is neither fast nor easy work, but it is necessary to ensure that one day the promise of America is the practice of America for all people. So despite these efforts to dehumanize and intimidate, despite the pushback that we're seeing from the racists that we have on the run, I want all of the residents of Connecticut to know that we are in this together, that we have to be united. For young people in particular, you matter, that you are our future. I'm only 30, but <laughs> I look a little bit younger than that. <laughs> but you are critical to placing your hand on the arc of history and bending it toward justice. And so I want you to maintain the hope that you have and the fire that you have to see real change. We shall not be moved. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Awet, for your leadership and for being here. And I'd like to bring up Mr. Corey Betts of the Hartford NAACP. Yay. Good afternoon. I want to say a quote by Robert Kennedy before I get started. He says, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different certains of energy, and daring those ripples to build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I am here representing the state conference, um, President Scott Exdale, and I want to let you guys know that we have a very serious concern about the racist acts that's going on here in Manchester and throughout our state and our nation. And we will be monitoring and making sure that these young men who did these racist acts will be brought to making sure that they're being charged to the fullest. So we'll be following the police, we'll be following the prosecutors, we'll be following everybody to make sure that these individuals will not, and they will know that these things will not be tolerated, not in our state and not in our nation. So I'm just here to, to represent and let you guys know this will not be tolerated. So just be on the lookout for us and, and following these incidents that's going on throughout our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Uh, with that, uh, we would be happy to entertain any questions, and we have this very distinguished panel of experts right here. How much, how much can you get done in a special session that would be viewed as, as enough of a start and enough progress? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think based on what we've heard from leadership um, and in terms of the timing of getting things done for a July special session, certainly there are some limitations. Um, we are, first we need to have actual legislation beyond police accountability um, bill, you know, absentee voting is, is a different issue. Um, but we're having those conversations. You know, I was on a call with, with Senator Winfield last night um, and Senator McCory last night. Black and Puerto Rican Caucus has been meeting regularly uh, discussing some of the issues that Senator Anwar has hinted at around housing and zoning. Um, but no doubt, you know, there are political limits to what I, th what I think we can accomplish. Um, and it's not because of the people necessarily standing behind me, but people who represent communities around the state that don't have the same desire and will to see the kind of systemic change that takes place, or perhaps fearful of what that systemic change might look like for them. So, Senator, what do you think? You, you laid out somewhat of an agenda. Yes. Uh, with, on, on the Juneteenth, you, you recall that uh, the Senate Democrats came together and made a statement that we need a much more comprehensive strategy to address during the special session. Um, I think that um, this time is of critical value. Uh, this moment is a moment that we need to use to make a bigger difference. Yes, police brutality is part of the concerns that we have, but the, the challenges are much broader than that. So I know that my colleagues uh, that I have been in touch with, they remain committed to making sure that we just don't do a symptomatic treatment. We actually do a much more therapeutic strategy. Um, we have to uh, bring that. I'm actually working with some of uh, my colleagues uh, to have a, a bill ready. Um, I, I'd rather wait. Maybe this Tuesday you'll get to hear more about it. I think one of the rallying cries from a lot of protesters that we've heard from. We need an answer. Pardon? We need an answer. Right. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, the bill that I'm talking about um, includes a lot of my colleagues. And it is not my place, while I'm chair of the housing, out of respect for them, I don't want to be able to speak about it. I think we will have to have a spec specific press conference around that. That's why I did not answer. Well, it's really the, the, the very issue that the House passed, the building of the Senate, 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 the
you yeah. know, I think it's a little more egregious. And for everybody to stand here, and this is where the whole rallying cry comes in, it's always easy for a politician to, uh, everybody rallies, everybody shows up when it's incident like that, but when it really comes to what the real issues are, the police brutality. Mm -hmm. right. Manchester Superior Court. Tyler State Attorney Matthew Kodansky, who takes video, body cam video, dash cam video, and edits it, edits it and alters it to suit their narrative. Come on, sister. That's a problem. And for everybody to be here and nobody address that, we're, we're all here, we're all having one big kumbaya moment, but nobody's addressing the real issues. There's some severe police brutality issues yes. in Manchester. Yes, it is. The two people who were killed by Manchester cops out of all the 21 were killed by SWAT team. Why is there black men killed by SWAT teams in Manchester? Right. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to all the other places. And nobody has anything to say. I find it to be quite amazing. Nobody has anything to say. We're going to pass an audience law. You want to pass law for body cam video. Why pass a law for body cam video when Matthew Gadansky is going to edit it anyway? Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. proof that he does that. Matthew Gadansky, first of all, should be disbarred for tampering with evidence. Yes, he yeah. should. That's a yes, crime. He should. If I tamper with evidence, I would be in jail right now. Yes, you would. How is he even attorney? Anybody on here? Governor, how was Matthew Gadansky attorney? And he offers and edits the video. Come on, come Jose on. Jose Soto will not get any justice because yep. Matthew Gadansky is going to do what he always does. Justice, no and peace. And nobody come talks on. about that. No justice, no peace. Come on. Thank you for I letting me speak. Yeah. Yeah. I can address that. And uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say his name, Jose Soto. I'm going to say his name. And I think about him every day. That happened in my district uh, a couple of miles away from my house. And uh, I can tell you that I have been working uh, with our leaders in the legislature, Senator Winfield uh, and Representative Stastrom, to speak to them about the Jose Soto case and to come up with some reforms uh, that are meaningful based on what happened there. So I uh, look forward to doing that, uh, hopefully in a few weeks. Hi, sorry, just one minute and we'll get to the governor. Go ahead, Pamela. Um, I, I have to say I'm not in the best of health right now, so pardon me, particularly if you hear some gurgling or whatever. I'm okay. Don't have COVID. I'm, I've been to the hospital. I'm sure of that. But I, I want to address a few things. Um, and again, I say that I am an activist a black woman long before I sit in a political seat. I am led by my community. I stand with my community. On two different levels when I, well, let me go to, to the children who were terrorized, and that's, that's my term, that they were terrorized. They weren't just chased. Um, and I'm gonna try to do this without crying because then you're really gonna know how much congestion I have in my chest right now. But they were terrorized. And some of us have almost become numb to this type of behavior. Our laws have always been deaf to these type of behaviors. And I've spoken to people in the community. Uh, and I've stated that I would like to see the charges changed so that they can be sentenced to the maximal sentence. I've stated that I would love to see a minimal sentence for terrorizing children be 10 years. Because these children are gonna be scarred for far longer than that. We have hate law crimes, hate law laws. And when I saw the bigotry charge, I'm like, how is that like murder to the first degree or negligent homicide as far as degrees? I've not yet figured that out to that degree as far as what exactly is the highest level of this hate crime that these men can be charged with. The next thing is looking at our judicial system. If we are not a part of the jury pool, it doesn't matter what the charges are. Because if the jury does not represent the family and the children, in this community, they can still walk free. We've seen that from the Rodney King uh, incident or, 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 or terrorism, 
to so many other times when we, we, we get a sense of hope, when we hear charges, we get a sense of hope, like something's gonna happen, something's gonna change. And then a jury is blind, and justice is blind, and the scales of justice are so unbalanced, and the criminals walk away, or maybe they're fired, but then they're hired in another town. I'm a graduate of Prairie View a &M University. Sandra Bland, I say her name, we've made a, a street after her on my college campus. We say her name every day. I understand what was in Sarah Bland's heart. I was educated at an HBCU. I know what it means to challenge somebody when they are saying to me, I will stomp on your civil rights. She was only speaking to being treated civilly and she died in a jail. The justice system allowed her murderer to walk away free because she was not represented, her family was not represented in a jury pool. So I will say to us as a community and standing together for solidarity, it is the whole judicial system. It is not just criminal charges. It is the way we are eliminated and excluded from being a part of the justice system when it comes to sentencing, when it comes to uh, finding someone guilty or not guilty. And then I will say, I presented a resolution and I'm 100% confident that it's gonna be passed where racism is a public health crisis. I am very proud to say I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. My sorority chapter president spearheaded that resolution. There are so many towns that I know for certain will pass this resolution. It's already been passed in Bloomfield. It's already been passed in Windsor and in Hartford. And I will say to you, it means a lot when we are in these positions. My sorority sister is on the council. In, in, in Windsor, so they had their council meeting first, which is why there's pass first. And we are sisters all over, and we sit in these seats so that we can pass resolutions like this. But we need to hear from you to know to pass resolutions like this. Um, I am, and, and, and people in my community know, I am beyond accountable. I will call people in my community to say, what do we need? I need you to show up. I need you to show up so that people can see when I am speaking about our community, there is a community that's visible for people to see and not say, oh, you're just saying that kind of out of your head. So I am very proud, very humble, that we are here in numbers to show that black lives do matter. And I will also let you know, regarding the Dansky, that long before the, the, the so-called, well, not the so-called, the movement, and this has to be a movement, this has to be a revolution, this just can't be a moment in time. We had already started addressing Gdansky. We've already sent a letter forward to have him removed from the Jose Soto situation. We've already done that, from the whole Jose Soto murder. Let, let me get my terminology straight. Um, and you gotta charge it to my, to my head when I'm rushing um, as far as what term I'm using. So Manchester has a horrible history. It's a reflection of the history of America. Manchester has probably one of the weakest levies when it comes to racism out of any town in the state. A lot of people are here today, and we're here today, to hopefully go beyond a photo op. Because if the levy breaks in Manchester, there's, not, there's no telling what's gonna spew throughout the state of Connecticut. The community is what's holding the levy still right now. The voices of power up, Black Lives Matter, ABAC, Youssef, Josh Powell is in a universalist church, uh, MLAC. People don't understand that this goes far beyond podiums in this library. 
This goes night calls, calls early in the morning, visiting people, uh, trying to, to have masks on in rallies, 24 hours, Walmart rallies, rallies, rallies in front of Olive Gardens. There are people who are doing their part. And then you have, thank you, thank you. And then you have people sitting in seats making laws, saying, okay, I hear you. And in my position, I can write a law about that. And in my position, I have the mayor and our, our, our board of directors who support this. So we need you. We are following your lead, even though we are your leaders. But we're really following your lead. And I'll let the mayor speak more about the letter that we have sent to have Kadeski removed. Yeah. Yeah. You should hear it when she calls you at midnight. <laughs> yeah, uh, we sent a letter uh, to the Chief of State's Attorney's Office addressing the, uh, the conflicts of uh, Mr. Uh, Gdansky being from Tallinn and the Crest unit covering Tallinn. So uh, um, Pam said an awful lot, but that's what it was. We've asked for uh, the Chief of State's Attorney's Office to look at who is uh, looking over this case, and we've asked them to remove Mr. Gdansky. Thank yes, you. Yes. Did you hear back from the Chief State's Attorney's Office? It just went out the other day, and uh, we gave them a date to respond, so hopefully in a couple weeks. Yeah. Hold them to it. Thank you all so much for your advocacy and for everything that you do in this community. Thank you to everyone who can. Can we just get the governor to give his thoughts on what his expectations are in the special session? Because really focused on his accountability yeah, thank you, Paz. Um, the, the special session and how much we can get done in the special session. Um, Pamela or whoever, I, I'm looking at this folks here. I mean, I heard about the jury and who's in the jury and how do you set that up. Um, we need better juries. We need more blacks as attorney. As young lady, I want you to be an attorney. I want you to stand up. I want you to be able to fight for people. I want you to be able to defend people and prosecute people that deserve yeah, to be yeah. prosecuted. Yeah. I need you to be judges. I need people that represent our community. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, nobody will ever have a sense of confidence that justice is being served. Right. And uh, Paz, um, I, I don't have an answer in this sense. It's going to be a short session in the middle of a COVID crisis, and I'm hearing um, Saud and others, we want to do big fundamental things. I see people like um, right over here, in terms of power up Manchester, I want you in that room. I want you as part of the public hearing. I want you there as part of the decisions as we make them going forward. I'm not positive you can do all of that in the special session, but we can see what we can get done. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you all being here.